I'll buy on myself in a minute. <laughs> you can make it short. I'll, I can introduce myself. It's not a big deal. Oh. Next week is the Oh. The format is basically you want to do an hour, a little more than an hour of presentation and questions. Is that how you like to do it? We have to run for an hour and a half. For an hour and a half? So usually about 50 minutes. Okay. And then we ask for questions. Okay. The registered students need to ask questions for credit, so there's no shortage of questions. Okay, great. Welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Fulton State University, hosted by the Center for Transportation Studies. My name is Chris Monsieur. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And together with uh, Jennifer Dill, or my colleagues Jennifer Dill, uh, Rob Bertini, and John Glebe, we arrange, in, uh, arrange this uh, seminar every Friday. Um, so before I introduce the speaker, I want to remind everybody that we are broadcasting over the web. So when you use, uh, when you ask a question, uh, be sure to light the microphone light so that people viewing over the web can hear your question. These are also recorded in archives, so it's also good to have your question in the archives. So, um, and I'd like to, uh, we're very pleased to have Thomas Endicott from Sequential Biofuels here to present uh, to us today. So without any further ado, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, for everyone, for coming to listen to a presentation uh, on biofuels this afternoon. Uh, I am a co-founder and managing partner of Sequential Biofuels. We're a biofuels marketing, distribution, production, and retail company uh, here in Oregon. We're based in Portland and Eugene. Um, and I was asked to come today and sort of give an overview about um, uh, biofuels and how it relates to the future of, of transportation. 
Um, what I want to do is give you sort of an overall context and then a little bit about my, our company, Sequential Biofuels, an overall context about kind of transportation fuels in general, um, then talk to you a little bit about the benefits of biofuels and the uh, economic development potential for the Northwest and, and for the greater uh, U.S. where biofuels is concerned. So first let me start. Uh, as I mentioned, Sequential, we are a, a private company. We're a four-year-old company. Um, we do biofuel production. We have a joint venture partnership with a company called Pacific Biodiesel. We built the only commercial biodiesel production facility in Oregon. It produces a million gallons of biodiesel per year. It's located in Salem. Uh, it's been running for about a year and a half now. It's maxed out, and it will expand next year. Um, we also look into other biofuels, which I'll, I'll cover uh, ethanol in this presentation, and we've also been exploring biogas as a substitute for natural gas. Um, distribution, I'll talk more about distribution, but as you can imagine, we use a tremendous amount of transportation fuel, gasoline and diesel fuel, um, and it all has to get from wherever it was created to wherever it's finally used. And we got our start in this business in distribution, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the presentation. Um, we're also a retail company. We have about 20 um, different uh, sites that are branded sequential biodiesel up and down the I-5 corridor, Hood River, McMinnville, um, soon to be Seaside. Um, and this has been a project of, of four years to basically get biodiesel uh, availability from zero to where it is today, and it's come a long way. So we're also in the retail business, and of course, uh, maybe most importantly for us, we opened our own sequential branded biofuel retail station in Eugene about a month ago, um, and I'll, I'll show you a couple photos and show you the products that we're offering there. Um, it's really uh, a differentiation in the transportation fuel retail side of things, which really has never existed. Um, and finally, um, with, the, with the big bold logo here, and perhaps some of you have seen some of these riding, riding around town, um, ultimately we're a branding and marketing company, and that's been the way that we have tried to increase awareness and also increase availability and opportunities for production of biofuels in, in Oregon. So my first slide here, a lot of different pictures there, but biofuels, the power of choice. And I think throughout this presentation, think about the choices that we all make as individuals or as groups of individuals, the city of Portland, the state of Oregon, the U.S. government, and everything we do is, is based around choice. How many of you uh, subscribe to wind power here in, great, in Portland? Um, you may know Portland, as I understand it, uh, Oregon PGE customers have the highest subscription to wind power, right? And that has an impact by choosing that. We've had a very robust um, growth in wind energy in the Northwest, and that's certainly supported by the market. Um, anyone have children in the, uh, in the group? Yeah. Uh, I don't have any children myself, but I have friends who do, and certainly that's a choice that you make that then impacts a lot of other choices that you make down the road. So thinking about the future um, for children. And of course, how many drivers do we have in the room? And how many of you use biodiesel? Anyone? Fantastic. How many of you use ethanol? It's blended in. Very good. If you're here between November and February in Portland, you all use ethanol, whether you know it or not. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit in the presentation as well. So before we get to biofuels, let's, let's look at uh, the larger transportation fuel context. Um, predominantly in the U.S., gasoline and diesel fuel, right? And, you know, where do we, where do we source petroleum crude? What's the uh, total amount of uh, petroleum imports into the U.S. at this point? Anybody know? It's around 60%. So 40% domestic, 60% imported. When we're importing it, where is it coming from? Sometimes in the Middle East, Alaska, Venezuela, outside of the U.S. of the U.S. for sure. And how is crude oil turned into gas and diesel fuel? What's that? Refineries. And what does anyone know the sort of the the uh, very basic way that that crude is refined? Heat it in a separate gear. Exactly. It's it's a very heat intensive process. It's basically boiling the the crude and having the different uh, compounds 
come off as vapor at different, at different pressures. Very, very, very high temperature. So of course, a lot of energy involved in getting it. Here's a, here's a, a cracking tower at a refinery in Anacortes, Washington. Um, by the way, how many, or, how many oil wells are there in Oregon? What's Oregon's total production of crude every year? Zero. How, refining capacity, what's our refining capacity here? Zero. So it's an interesting idea, and, and we'll get to that in a second. So it's coming from far away. Uh, we have to do some maybe questionable things in order to make sure that we get it. Um, and it's taking a lot of energy to produce it. So how about, let's get to some numbers. Um, markets for crude oil in the world. How many million barrels of crude are consumed in the world every day? Does anyone know? Close. It's roughly 80 million barrels per day. 42 gallons per barrel. Tremendous amount of, of product. Now, how much of that is consumed by the U.S. every day? <laughs> by, by number or by percentage? Anyone know percentage-wise how much of the total crude the U.S. uses? About 25%. So we're using roughly 20 million barrels of petroleum yeah, every day. And that's going into transportation fuels, plastics, fertilizers, all, all different types of materials. Um, okay, so President Bush said we're addicted to oil, and we are. How addicted are we? Who is the next largest consumer? We're the largest co single consumer of petroleum crude in the world. China is next. Japan is close behind them. How much does China use? Anyone want to guess? Close. So they're, they're at about 6 million. So not only are we addicted, our economy depends on these fuels. We are very tied to the petroleum markets, as we see every day. Um, and this is only going to increase over time. Just a couple other numbers. The, the numbers that I've seen that um, worldwide consumption is increasing by about 1.5% per year. Um, the numbers, apparently, for consumption in China and India, which, by the way, both have over a billion people each. Um, the consumption numbers for those uh, countries this year apparently were underestimated. They're really pushing consumption. They want the kind of lifestyle that we have. They, want, they need the kind of energy that we have. Um, world production of oil is declining. The current wells that are existing are declining on average about 4% per year. So has anyone ever heard of Hubbard, British geologist uh, around World War II? Um, this is a supply curve that he, he basically looked at geologic history and he said, you know, we know the period of time when oil was formed. We know it was formed. And does anyone know what the pre predominantly it was formed from? Not dinosaur bones, kind of plants, but it was mostly algae. So it was mostly very thick mats of algae at a period of time in, in, in geologic history where there was tremendous CO2 concentration in the environment. These algae evolved. They were taking in the CO2, producing oxygen. This is when things shifted. And they were lying in water. So they were able to die, fall under the water, and not be decomposed in oxygen. So that's where they were, they were predominantly produced. He looked at geologic history, and he said, you know, we know when it was formed. We have an idea of how much photosynthetic material was on the planet. So we know basically how much total crude oil there is on the planet. And he said, it is... Let me turn this. I don't know if I can turn it off, but... He said it's roughly two trillion barrels of oil. That's how much is on the planet. We started, we started using oil around 1859 The first in the US. The first 50 years of oil was for what? 1850 to 1900 was? Lighting. Exactly, kerosene. There was a global market for kerosene lights. Edison by the, invented the light bulb. Things changed a little bit. They needed a new use. Started to go to transportation fuel. All the, all the internal combustion engines were created around the turn of the century. So we started out with a certain amount of looking for it, finding it, using it back in the, at the turn of the century. And as we went forward, we kept finding more and more and more and more and more. We kept getting better and better at it. But eventually, he said, there's only so much. So we're going to keep looking, and we're going to find a lot. And then at some point, we're going to come over the top, and we're going to find less and less and less and less and less. And so when you hear people talk about peak oil, what they're saying is, if you look at the area under that curve, it would be the point at which half of it is gone. Half of it is, is found and produced, and then we're down the other side. So this is a supply curve. Everybody knows simple economics, right? So anyone want to venture a guess at what the demand curve looks like? 
So here's a demand curve. Now, it's questionable about when, we've, when the world has peaked in oil production. It's pretty well assumed that, that uh, the U.S. peaked around 1970, 1971. Um, other countries have peaked. But this is the worldwide demand curve. And so where we are today, uh, I was crunching some numbers earlier, 80 million barrels a day is roughly about 30 billion barrels per year. So we're, we're in this range right now. It's questionable as to where the peak is. But the important thing here is that there's only a limited amount of petroleum. It, we're going to find less and less of it. We're going to want, as an as a, as a, as a entire planet, more and more of it. And the difference is going to be the price. And that's what we've seen since Hurricane Katrina and the price spikes in oil. It's been competition for a limited resource. This is a, um, a cover of National Geographic, and I think it was June of 2004. You may not be able to read it in the back, but it says, think gas is expensive now? Just wait. You've heard it before, but this time it's for real. We're at the beginning of the end of cheap oil. We're not at the beginning of the end of oil. We're at the beginning of the end of cheap oil. So let's talk about U.S. and transportation fuels. In the U.S., we consume, these are 2002 numbers. We're a little bit higher now, but these are the ones that I've used for a while. 57 billion gallons of diesel, 110 billion gallons of gasoline burned in the U.S. to propel vehicles. Um, those are huge numbers, and they're kind of hard to fathom. So let's look at Oregon. 720 million gallons of diesel every year, 1.4 billion gallons of gasoline every year. Still large numbers, right? So let's look at it on a daily basis. We use about 2 million gallons of diesel and 4 million gallons of gasoline every day in Oregon. Are these numbers related to trans for transportation? No. No, it's, it's total, and, and transportation will be a, a segment of that. But we're talking about total, total use of, of gas and diesel, um, on-road, off-road, heating oil, uh, all those different types of things. So um, we're a small state. California is 10 times the size that we are. If you want to talk about that, this in terms of tanker trucks, if you watch the big two, two tanks, you know, a tank wagon and this articulated trailer that go down the road to fill the gas stations, it's 200 of those per day in Oregon for diesel, 400 per gas. In California, it's 2,000 per day and 4,000 for gas. Tremendous amount of product, tremendous amount of energy, and finally, tremendous amount of money. Maybe you can just connect to it. Then it'd be happy. Uh, I'll try that next time it pops up. So let's look at it in terms of dollars. Oregon has no oil wells, no refineries. Every day, we're shipping roughly at, at two dollars a gallon, and this is X tax and wholesale pricing, roughly twelve million dollars a day out of the Oregon economy. Uh, there were numbers reported recently uh, earlier this week that said the U.S. trade deficit now is the highest it's ever been, and it's because of crude oil, because of our imports of crude oil. So let's talk about some some options. Um, all right, I'm going to try to connect here. Let's see. If we is it going to be bad? I'll tell you what, I won't, I won't try. I won't try. The future, that, so, you know, the future is now. Who believes that the future is going to happen? You know, it's going to come, right? And so what, what it's going to be like is very dependent on the choices that we make and ultimately the impact of those choices. So when we think about, we've talked about petroleum and the impact of petroleum. Um, I came out of planning school, um, graduate program down at, in, in Eugene at U of O, and um, we, we studied sustainability, which I think doesn't mean a whole lot by itself, but we're really looking at social, economic, and environmental impacts of the choices that we make. And we're talking about transportation fuels. So we've talked a little bit about how that works for, for petroleum-based fuels. So as we go through this, let's think about how this relates to biofuels. So first, advantages of biofuels. Um, they are domestically produced. So um, at this point, all the biodiesel and all the ethanol consumed in the U.S. is produced in the U.S. We, we are not importing biodiesel or ethanol. Um, there was, I think there was some small shipments to Florida biodiesel, but it's, it's predominantly U.S. made. And that means the money from those industries and the sale of those products stays here in the U.S. Even better, could stay in the Northwest when there are production facilities here. Um, and there's some amount of energy security by producing some of that domestically. And of course, they are renewable. So they're made from plants, um, biodiesel from oil producing plants, vegetable oil producing plants, or animal fat, ethanol from uh, grains, 
starches are sugars, sugar cane, wheat, corn, rye, barley. And they also have a huge impact on greenhouse gas reduction. As, as I was coming over today, uh, they were on NPR talking about, they were going to talk about cal what California is doing policy-wise to talk about reducing CO2 emissions there and what it's going to do to impact their economy. So biofuels are significant greenhouse gas reduction, and I'll, I'll go into further detail in, in a few minutes. And finally, performance-wise, they're non-toxic, they're biodegradable, and they're cleaner burning. Their emissions profile is much better than the petroleum base, and they're seamless with petroleum. So this is not a big infrastructure change like going to natural gas or hydrogen, if you believe that's even possible. This is talking about fuels that fit into the current distribution and retail and, and um, equipment infrastructure. Anyone know who that is? Ah, no That'd one. Rudolph. That is Rudolph Diesel. That is Rudolph Diesel. He was the inventor of the diesel engine. Um, the engine is named after him. It's not named after the fuel. And in fact, his first fuel was peanut oil. He used peanut oil in, in the engine that he invented in 1895. And this is just an interesting quote from him. The use of vegetable oils for engine fuels may seem insignificant today in 1912 when petroleum production was really ramping up. But such oils may become in the course of time as important as petroleum and the coal tar products at the present time. So maybe a little bit of back to the future. Well, let's talk about diesel equipment just by itself. Does anyone, anyone, you drive a diesel. What do you like about your diesel vehicle? My diesel vehicle runs well, on straight vegetable oil. That's fantastic. And what type of vehicle do you have? It's a Volkswagen Golf. And what kind of mileage do you get? I get about 45. 45 miles to the but gallon. I drive slow. <laughs> <laughs> so diesels have been around for a long time. We haven't seen them in the passenger um, vehicle market here so much, but they're definitely the choice for, for freight and for uh, heavy industry because they are very reliable. They last twice as long as a gas engine. They're durable. They're very, very powerful. And maybe most importantly, they're incredibly fuel efficient. So um, when we talk about using a lot of transportation fuel, some of the, some of the possible... Uh, uh, changes that we can make in the future is perhaps using more efficient technology. Um, this is just to give you a, a little bit of, a, of an idea. Volkswagen Jettas, these are numbers from cars101.com, basically about a 30% increase in miles per gallon from the exact same Volkswagen Jetta from a gas engine to a diesel engine. So in Europe, um, they have about 50% of all passenger vehicles are diesel there. They pay seven, eight dollars a gallon for fuel. Um, here in the U.S., um, three percent passenger vehicles. And in fact, Volkswagen and Mercedes are pretty much the only two that have it. But that's changing. I, uh, Honda and Toyota are talking about bringing um, diesels now that have been very, very popular in Europe. Biodiesel. What is it? Um, very simply, it's biodegradable diesel fuel that's made from renewable materials, vegetable oil, or animal fat. And basically what you're doing very simply is removing the glycerin from the vegetable oil. So the difference between biodiesel and, and the straight vegetable oil that you run in your vehicle is the biodiesel has the glycerin removed. And the final piece there is simply uh, that I always include. Technically, biodiesel meets this uh, um, American Society of Testing and Measure standard, which means that every batch of biodiesel that is commercial quality is always the same. And that gives um, fleets and end users the confidence that this product is, is a good product and it's always exactly the same. Not to go into too much of a detail, but a, a, a fat molecule or a vegetable oil molecule is a triglyceride. Tri meaning three, glycerin uh, connecting those three long chains. And what you're doing in the process is chemically removing the glycerin and freeing those chains. And those long chains are what's called methyl esters. They actually have a little alcohol uh, added to the end of them. Um, that is biodiesel and the glycerol is, is removed. Um, biodiesel, as I said, biofuels are cleaner burning. Biodiesel um, got its foothold in the U.S. market and the support of the U.S. government because it's cleaner burning and significantly cleaner burning for diesel. Um, I won't cover all these, but the big ones are particulate matter, um, and biodiesel can be blended with petroleum diesel in any proportion. So what you're seeing here is B100 being pure biodiesel and B20 being 20% biodiesel blended with 80% petroleum diesel. So... The reductions are good at B20 on particulate, even better at um, B100. And the particulate is what you see black smoke, you know, out of a tractor trailer, out of, a, out of an older diesel. 
Um, we've now moved to ultra-low sulfur diesel. It's being transitioned in the U.S., and, and in the next couple years, you'll no longer see black smoke out of diesel engines. They've created emissions technology that's so good, it will eliminate that, um, regardless of whether they're burning biodiesel or ultra-low sulfur diesel. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, these two are important. This is a toxic, uh, uh, the, the toxic nature of the fuel. Um, biodiesel is all very simple, straight chains of, of carbon and hydrogen molecules. Petroleum is complex ring molecules, spiral molecules, produces substances underground under heat and pressure that we don't, we don't see on the surface of the earth, and our bodies don't know what to do with it. So the biodiesel is uh, uh, incredibly, um, it lowers the, the emissions that would cause cancer, basically. Um, and then carbon dioxide. Um, biodiesel uh, does have a component of methanol, which is a fossil fuel. It's made from natural gas. But the part of it that is vegetable oil um, is basically no, zero net carbon gain because the plants are taking CO2 out of the atmosphere to make vegetable oil. That's being converted to biodiesel, burned in a vehicle to produce CO2, and the plants are taking that CO2 back again the following year. So basically a zero net carbon gain. It would be similar with ethanol growing corn or sugar cane or wheat uh, to produce ethanol. So... Um, when we first started in 2002, no one used biodiesel. Today, there are uh, a number of users, largely public fleets, that uh, began to use it because they felt like it was the right thing to do. Domestically produced, keeping money at home, lower emissions. Um, I won't go into all of them, but you can see uh, Eugene Corvallis in Portland, all on B20. City of Portland has run strictly B20 for the last two years in all its diesel vehicles. The Water Bureau recently went to B99.9, almost B100, um, a couple months ago, which is a first, the only other city that's ever done that that I know of is Berkeley. Um, largest user of biodiesel in the U.S. is the military. They're interested in alternatives to petroleum fuels. Um, some bus systems using higher blends, B40. Um, TriMet, one of the largest single biodiesel users in um, Oregon, and they're using a 5% blend just in their um, lift buses, in their handicap buses. So, um, and just a couple pictures, ODOT, um, the, two, the three largest users of biodiesel in Oregon are ODOT, the city of Portland, and TriMet. Um, this fuel can be used anywhere you use diesel fuel. This is Hoodoo Ski Resort, um, east of Salem. They use a 10% blend, and they use it year-round. So cold weather is not an issue at that, at that low blend. Um, private businesses, which um, I know feel that they get um, some really good um, um, PR and, and worthwhile PR because they're doing what they believe in. Neil Kelly is a, is a uh, remodeling contractor here in Portland. Um, and this is a, uh, a boat that ran two large John Deere engines on B100 on the Columbia. Um, it's since gone down to Coos Bay, um, but it was a, it was a cruise uh, ship on the, on the Columbia here in Portland. So that's kind of an overview of biodiesel. Now I'll talk a little bit about bioethanol. Um, and bioethanol simply meaning ethanol made from biological sources. It can be made from petroleum sources, but it generally isn't done. It is made from taking starch crops, um, converting them into sugar, and then fermenting them, so microbes fermenting them into uh, alcohol that's then distilled. It's basically moonshine. Literally, it is pure grain corn alcohol um, in the U.S. Its main uses are to... Um, basically enhanced vehicle performance. It's an octane booster. Some of you may have heard, you know, Arco always has 10% ethanol in their gasoline to boost the octane. Um, and it's also uh, to reduce emissions, especially carbon monoxide emissions. And that's why the city of Portland blends 10% um, ethanol into all of the gasoline sold in the city between November and February. Um, it's an it's a EPA mandate in order to re uh, reduce carbon monoxide in the air shed here. Um, so just um, to go now from what it is, how it works, to how you get it into the market. So um, biodiesel interchangeable with petroleum diesel in any diesel application, heating oil, generators, uh, tractors, boats, trucks, cars, anything that uses diesel. And ethanol is blendable with gasoline. It's not, we don't have um, uh, vehicles or equipment in the U.S. that runs straight ethanol that comes from a, a factory. Um, sequential, as I mentioned, we have about 20 biodiesel pumps up and down I-5, and in the beginning, um, it was much more rudimentary. Now they are 
pumps at stations that are just like gasoline or diesel fuel at a station. As I mentioned earlier, um, biodiesel and ethanol can both be blended with uh, biodiesel with diesel, ethanol with gasoline. Common blends for biodiesel are a 5% um, biodiesel with 95% petroleum, 20% biodiesel, 80% petroleum, 99% biodiesel um, with 1%, actually 99.9 with 0.1%. And then ethanol, 10% ethanol, very common at gas stations in Portland, down in California, reformulated gasoline. And then some of you have probably heard the Live Green, Go Yellow slogan campaign by GM um, that is uh, basically promoting flex fuel vehicles that can use up to 85% ethanol. Um, there were uh, no 85% ethanol pumps in Oregon until we opened our station in Eugene. That was the first one, although the vehicles have been out there since around 2000. Um, there are now, I think, two here in Portland as well, and uh, many, many more in the Midwest where they produce ethanol. Um, so just to give you a little more, a little, just a little bit more, um, B5 is the same as diesel. It actually meets number two diesel standards, so it's the same as diesel. Um, B20 is uh, uh, a good emissions reduction for less, for least cost. Biodiesel is generally more expensive than diesel, but not that much more these days. And B99 is almost pure. In fact, it only has a little bit of diesel to take advantage of a tax credit. Um, and I will mention, because people are always interested, the B5 and B20 are really seamless with diesel vehicles. Any diesel vehicles, it's really, um, you know, B20 and the next tank diesel, B5, the next tank diesel, not a big deal. B99 has some considerations um, that I won't go into very deeply, but they can easily be overcome, and there are a lot of people in Oregon driving B99. Um, ethanol, E10 is... Uh, it can be used in any conventional gasoline, so every engine can use E10. It is a MTBE replacement. If you all know about methyl, tertiary, butyl, I can't remember the last word, um, terrible ground, groundwater pollutant made from methanol, made from natural gas, actually um, banned in California, and ethanol does the same functionally to the fuel to reduce emissions at MTBE. Slightly higher cost, but not all the, all the uh, environmental problems. Uh, when California banned MTBE, they created a market for a billion gallons of ethanol overnight. Pretty amazing. Um, and it does increase octane rating of the fuel by adding it to gasoline. And then E85 flex for flex fuel vehicles. They have to be flex fuel vehicles, whereas any diesel vehicle can run different blends of biodiesel. Uh, a f you have to have a flex fuel vehicle to run E85. Uh, very high octane. And ethanol has historically been less expensive than gasoline, um, some, some things uh, have changed in the last year and a half or so um, that, have, that have changed that, but it's, it's close to the same price now. Okay. So let's talk about a little bit about distribution. Um, most of the biofuels currently in the U.S. are made in the Midwest. So bio, most biodiesel is made from soybean oil. Most ethanol is made from corn. This is the corn-soy belt of the, of the U.S., most of the production happens there. When um, distribution first began in the Northwest, um, there were rail cars of biodiesel coming into Portland, uh, Seattle, actually Tacoma and San Francisco. The same has been true for ethanol for years and years and years. So it's, it's produced in the Midwest and transported to the West Coast. It's starting to change a little bit. And once it gets here, as I mentioned, it's seamless with the distribution infrastructure. So this is uh, one of our distribution partners in Eugene, Tyree Oil. Um, the biodiesel and the bioethanol are both stored in tanks that previously stored gas or diesel fuel, transported in the same trucks that transport gas and diesel fuel, and then, of course, dispensed out of the same pumps, same infrastructure, really seamless. Um, and in Portland, we have um, uh, five here, five um, locations, two B20s uh, and uh, two B99s, actually three B99s and two B20s here in Portland, and then actually Tigard and Gresham in the Portland area. And then Sequential actually has pumps all um, down the I-5 corridor, um, which was, there were no pumps in 2002, and now there's a good network of pumps. 
So the product is available. Um, and retail. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many people really think about where they go to buy gas. To me, Shell, Chevron, Texaco, no more Texaco, uh, Arco, they're, they're all pretty much the same. You, it's a utility kind of a thing. Um, when Sequential began, much like the green power, you know, buying green power and, and believing in the impact of green power, we believed that there was a market of people who would be interested in buying biofuels in a convenient, conventional way um, because they believe in the impact. And this was a rendering um, back in 2002 when we started uh, an idea about what a renewable biofuel station could look like. Um, and over the past year, we've developed a site in Eugene that was a former polluted gasoline station, cleaned up. It was a brown field. It was cleaned up with the help of DEQ and EPA and um, Oregon Economic and Community Development Department, Lane County, a lot of partners. And the, concept, the, the idea was, you know, what can we do on this site, not only provide the fuels, but also do as many renewable, sustainable type elements to the, to the building as possible as well. So bioswales for stormwater management and keeping the pollution on site as much as possible, solar panels for power, providing biodiesel and ethanol, um, blended products for all vehicles. Um, we didn't actually do an electrical ve electric vehicle charging station. That, that was really not feasible. Um, and, and a market that's more like, um, more like Whole Foods than, you know, Shell Station. So that's what it looks like now um, in reality. So uh, 33 kW solar array over the, um, over the pumps there should produce about 50% of all the power that we, that we use during the course of a year. Grid intertied with the utility, so we give them more. We give them back power when we have too much. They give us power when we don't have enough. A living roof um, over the over the convenience store there. There's 5,000 plants planted on the roof. Helps cool the building in the summertime. Um, helps slow the water um, uh, flow off the site in the in the um, in the winter. Less infiltration. It's a passive solar design building. Less energy use. A lot of different elements like that. Um, and there's another uh, a shot, you know, of the of the solar panels and the and the pumps. We do provide E10 and E85 as well as B5, B20, B99, um, and the convenience store with a local coffee shop there on the other side, and then convenience type items um, in the store. So on to production. Talk a little bit about production. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Sequential has a joint venture. Um, partnership with Pacific Biodiesel from Maui, Hawaii. Um, when Sequential began, our idea was how much more sustainable could you get than making diesel fuel for efficient diesel engines out of products that were collected or harvested in the Northwest, processed here in the Northwest that would add to jobs and economic development type ideas, and then consumed here in the Northwest and getting the benefit of the emissions reductions of biodiesel. Um, it took us a couple years, and it took us the ability to build a market that was a million gallons a year to be able to build this facility. So um, we have a number of partners. Um, Willie Nelson is an investor. That's why he's up there. Um, we do, we do um, process used cooking oil, which uh, when we started was the only feedstock that was available in the Northwest. Um, no soybeans grown here. Um, Kettle is a great supporter. They provide some oil. Um, and they also use the product. And Burgerville is actually our single, uh, single largest supplier of used cooking oil. I think they have about 45 restaurants in, um, in the Northwest. Um, and much like I showed you on the small scale there, biodiesel can be made from any type of vegetable oil or animal fat. Canola and mustard are both ag crops that could be grown here in the Northwest. Um, we have a certain amount of waste vegetable oil, USDA says, every person generates a gallon a year. So we have about 10 million gallons a year in Oregon and Washington. Um, it's never been disposed of. It's always been sold to a market that was generally livestock feed. And increasingly now, um, Asia is buying it up for things like soap making and cosmetics and things like that. Um, so we have the ability to grow some of these, these crops, canola, where there's grass seed grown on the west side, wheat grown on the east side. Uh, we have quite a commercial food processing industry in the Northwest, and certainly plenty of restaurants in the cities where there are a lot of people, and we do have some, some meat processing. 
In order to get it done, you need uh, to build a plant. You've got to choose a technology. We were Pacific Biodiesel's fifth plant. They just announced they're building their 10th plant in California. Um, and we're small on the scale of most biodiesel production facilities. In the Midwest, they are building them at 25 and 30 million gallons a year. We're at a million gallons a year, expanding to three to four million gallons a year. Um, takes money to be able to do this. Um, and uh, the plant costs uh, over a million dollars to build. Um, Pacific and Sequential are partners, but also some great programs here in Oregon with the Oregon Office of Energy, which actually has a loan program that they basically can act like the bank, and they have acted like the bank for us on um, the biodiesel plant and on the retail station. Um, also a very attractive business energy tax pro um, credit program here that really there's nothing like it anywhere else in the U.S. Um, and of course some private investors um, to be able to come in. And on the other side, you see different types of methyl ester, and biodiesel is methyl ester. So regardless of what the uh, fuel is made from, it will still meet that ASTM specification. And then, of course, the, the byproduct is glycerin, um, and uh, everybody's trying to figure out what to do with millions of gallons of glycerin produced by biodiesel plants. Yeah? Can any of those inputs be, be blended, or does the process, like if you're going to make it, one way you have to use all vegetable oil or um, inputs be? They generally would not be blended as they make biodiesel. Once they are biodiesel, then they, would, they could be blended. So you could get a finished soy product and a finished used cooking oil product and then blend them together when they went to market. And that's, that's commonly done. Um, this is what the plant looks like. It's very small. It's 8,000 square feet. It looks more like a brewery or a food processing facility than that big cracking tower, you know, with a, a, a petroleum facility. Very low energy. It's a chemical reaction. It happens at room temperature. Does a little better at a little bit higher temperature, but not, not super high. Um, and we do run off predominantly used cooking oil. Um, these types of trucks, we have contracts with collectors, and they range around pull this stuff out of restaurants, um, the brown gold, if you will, for us. Um, and, in the, and in the process, no matter if you're doing this in a jar or a blender or doing it on a large scale, you're doing the same thing, which is removing the glycerin on the left from the biodiesel that's on the right. <laughs> um, use cooking oil, glycerin, not, not so much. I mean... Um, I know the co-op here in Portland does make soap out of it, and they say that it's good. So it's good soap. It's not. It's that color, um, but there. That's not pure glycerin. So if you if you really want to use it for something else, it's got to go through a several more steps that are pretty expensive to get there. Um, so that's the use cooking oil side of things. Um, let's talk about the uh, the agricultural side of things. And Oregon is a is a very large agricultural state. Um, Anyone know what, what crop that is? That's canola in full bloom. Canola is an oil seed crop. It produces a tiny little uh, black seed that looks like a BB that amazingly is about 40% oil by weight. It's the most prolific oil producing crop for temperate climates. Um, it's a brassica. It's in the same family as broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and a number of other brassica crops. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of grass seed production here in Oregon. Um, this is a grass seed field on the west side in the Willamette Valley, and it's been suggested that canola could be a very good rotation crop um, for the grass seed farmers. Um, this is a plot that is planted every year at OSU in Corvallis at the research farm there. Um, there's a lot of underutilized infrastructure in the valley and on the east side for that matter, but more so in the valley. This is a grain elevator in Ricreol that has been empty for, um, I think, more than 10 years now. Um, and then we go to the east side. Um, so this is on really the economic development side of things. This is a, a, a field of canola, um, 250 acres that was grown um, in eastern Oregon near Hermiston last year. Um, and this is uh, Kent Madison at Madison Farms and myself when I went out to visit with him. Um, and Kent, Kent's motivation on doing canola, he's a wheat farmer and a number of other crops. He has a 17,000 acre farm. Um, he has 47 center pivot irrigation plots. This is large scale commercial agriculture. Um, and he uses about 100,000 gallons of diesel per year in his operation. So his interest in biodiesel was 
I see the price of crude going up. I see the price of diesel going up. If I can produce this for my own vehicles on my own farm, this may be a real boon to me in the future. So his goal has been um, produce half of the biodiesel that he needs for his equipment on his farm, so 50,000 gallons a year. Um, and we've worked with him to source the rest of that oil to get it over into the Salem plant and produce biodiesel from the canola oil. And it's very small right now. Um, he grew uh, 250 acres last year. I think he's growing about 4,000 acres this year. Other farmers are now being contracted to grow more. Um, the crushing to go from uh, seed to meal and oil is um, generally in commercial scale larger than that, but that's where it starts. Um, and again, you end up with um, uh, same type of biodiesel. Virgin biodiesel tends to be much clearer in color, more yellow straw colored. Um, okay. And so just sort of going back over uh, as an overview here. So biofuels, um, very available now, um, really seamless in infrastructure. Um, and they were having trouble, you know, over time gaining larger market share. And why was that? Well, initially the awareness was very low. Um, I dare say that all of you in the last year have heard something in the news about biodiesel or ethanol. So awareness has really come up, especially with crude prices coming up. Um, availability was next to nil, except for things like blending 10% ethanol with all gasoline in Portland. But E85 was not available, biodiesel was not available to businesses or to fleets or to um, in, uh, individual drivers. So availability now has really, um, has really improved. Advocacy, I think, is kind of the, the third leg of that in order to increase the biodiesel market and the, and the ethanol market. Just to give you some contrast from those numbers at the beginning, um, the ethanol market last year was about 4 billion gallons a year. So compared with, I think we're about, about 120 billion gallons of gasoline, 4 billion gallons of ethanol. So it makes up uh, 2 to 3 percent of all the gasoline in the U.S. The biodiesel market last year in the U.S. was um, about 60 million gallons a year out of 65 billion gallons of diesel, really a drop in the bucket. Um, but growing and a much younger industry than the ethanol industry. In Oregon, um, we consumed about a million gallons of biodiesel last year, so um, our plant basically uh, could produce enough diesel for Oregon for about 12 hours out of the year. So we're very, very, very small, but a lot of room to grow. Um, and the ethanol market in Oregon, I think, is uh, up in the 60 million gallon a year range right now. So we, uh, we sort of have really made huge progress in awa awareness and availability. Um, biodiesel is still at a premium price. Bioethanol has generally been at a lower price, but it's kind of in parity with gasoline right now. Um, so if, if as, a, as individuals we support the impact of biofuels, then there are individuals who will go and, and pay a premium price to, you know, to use these types of products and, and feel good about doing it. But on the larger scale, if we want the larger impact of the economic development of production facilities of more and diverse crops for the ag producers, um, significant reductions in emissions, those types of things, we really have to increase the market significantly more. Um, and of course, going back to the beginning, biofuels are a way to help smooth the transition from petroleum um, that is, that is going to be declining over the next 25, 30 years. So advocacy, how does that, how does that play in? Uh, oh, here, let's go to I'll give you a couple facts here. So um, one thing about biofuels is they do have federal tax credits to keep them competitive with petroleum-based fuels. So um, there are some blending credits that reduce the price of biodiesel and ethanol to get it to a point where it's relatively close to, to petroleum fuels. Um, Ethanol market is, is quite well established, 4 billion gallons of product per year in the U.S. The biodiesel market is still quite small, but it's growing rapidly. Um, ethanol is available pretty much everywhere to all tanker truck companies, and that's not too much of a problem. Biodiesel has been limited, but it's, it's improving significantly, and more so in the Northwest and a lot of other places because of the demand. And finally, Pacific Northwest produced biofuels have to compete with comparable products from other regions of the U.S. or the world. So um, building biodiesel production here in the Northwest is a great idea, but we don't have soy production. We don't have huge commercial 
crushing capacity like they do in the Midwest. So we're going to be competing against trying to establish ourselves um, against that industry. And you may be familiar uh, even with um, foreign imports that could be threatening. Um, there are at least a couple of biodiesel plants in the Northwest that are not built yet that have suggested that they want to import um, palm oil from Malaysia and Indonesia um, because it's the cheapest form of vegetable oil that's out there. It also happens to be grown in plantations where they clear cut rainforest and, and plant palm plantations. So um, maybe the cheapest may not be the best. So there may be some policy issues around um, how we want to um, even uh, look at the impact of the biofuels that we might use. So advocacy, um, there's been a number of policy, um, uh, actually legislative bills in Oregon, in Washington, not so much in California. Um, there was a, a lobby day in 05 that had 100 um, biofuel-powered vehicles lined up, parked around the Capitol Mall, and about 200 people lobbying their legislators on a package of bills to help increase production and consumption of biodiesel and ethanol in, in Oregon. Um, those bills failed for, for a number of reasons, but the same uh, group of supporters are back again for the 07 legislature, which is starting to heat up now. Um, if, if anyone's interested, um, there's a good website, um, biofuels and the number for Oregon.org, that tracks the policy type stuff in Oregon. Um, HarvestCleanEnergy.org up in Washington um, tracks what they're doing up there. And Washington's a little bit ahead of us in Oregon on the policy side. They had a package of bills passed earlier this year. Um, so in terms of growing the market and the policies that affect that, the ethanol market in Oregon has largely been based on the Portland winter air quality requirement, that 10% blend. And actually, Portland has beat that requirement. And so this winter will be the last winter that that 10% blend is mandated. Um, we've actually been able, by um, just better emissions controls on, on gasoline vehicles, the carbon monoxide levels are now down below where EPA says they need to be. So that could be a loss of market here in, in Portland. However, not for the same reason, but you may be aware that the city council here in Portland um, passed a citywide renewable fuel standard a few months ago. Um, and this would basically require that uh, beginning July 1 of 07, all the gasoline sold in Portland year round would be 10% ethanol and all the, all the diesel in Portland sold year round would be 5% biodiesel. Uh, what this would do would create a market for, uh, I believe it's about 4 million gallons a year of biodiesel and it's about uh, 16 million gallons a year of ethanol. Um, so that's a policy decision that could, could go forward. There's been a, a discussion of a statewide renewable fuel standard in Oregon too, but that did not pass in the last legislative session. Washington, however, um, pulled together a, a renewable fuel standard that they passed earlier this year. So in Washington, by December of 2008, um, they will have uh, all of the diesel sold in Washington, 2% of that will have to be biodiesel, controlled at the, at the terminal level, not at the retail level. Um, and uh, I believe it's 5% of all their gasoline will have to be ethanol. So in Washington, we're talking about um, about 20 million gallons a year of biodiesel market overnight um, come December of 08. And on the ethanol side, I think it is in the 50 million gallon a year range in Washington. Um, and sort of as an overall, policy to increase the biofuels market actually makes room for those biofuel production facilities. So if we're really interested in you know, supporting the ag community, uh, and, and the jobs and the tax base and the energy security that could be created by biodiesel and ethanol production, the market has to be big enough to really be able to finance those, those projects knowing that whatever's produced there is going to make it into the market at a reasonable price. And then the same, by, you know, the, the, the same uh, idea of needing to compete against soy growers in the Midwest or palm oil plantations in Asia Farmers here in Oregon and in the Northwest may need incentives to be able to produce those biofuels from regionally sourced feedstocks. There are actually two ethanol plants under construction in Oregon right now. One is in Klatskanai, um, just uh, west of St. Helens. It's 100 million gallons a year uh, production, and it is solely based on number two dent corn 
grown in the Midwest, and they will have unit-long, mile, mile-long trains of corn coming into that facility a couple times a week. So jobs, yeah, you know, benefit of ethanol production and tax base maybe a little bit, but all the feedstock is going to come from the Midwest for that particular plant. Um, there's another plant in Boardman that's a 35 million gallon a year plant, and they plan to do the same thing, which is import corn from the Midwest. Um, and then regional governments may need to provide some type of support to make sure that that regional product is competitively priced. Right now, Sequential is dedicated to using feedstocks in our biodiesel plant that are, that are local to the region, to the Northwest region, but it's becoming difficult for us because the canola oil at this point can't be produced at a price that is comparable to soy. Um, we're actually willing to uh, blend it in and sort of homogenize the price because we think it's the right thing to do. But in the longer term, that may be a more difficult thing to do. Um, just to give you another little piece of uh, um, reference, Minnesota is a, is a state that's kind of the, the stalwart leader in biofuels. In Minnesota, they've had a 10% ethanol renewable fuel standard for all gasoline there since 1993. They passed a 2% biodiesel renewable fuel standard in 2005. They did a study, uh, and in the beginning in Minnesota, uh, they had a general fund program that paid 20 cents a gallon to ethanol producers in Minnesota for, on the first 15 million gallons per year of production for the first 10 years. So they were paying out for every five gallons of ethanol produced in Minnesota, the state government was paying a dollar in direct subsidy to those producers. They did a study on that program, and what their study showed them was that for every dollar they paid out of that program, they saw $11 in state tax revenue. They, they produced soybeans in Minnesota, they produced corn in Minnesota, but what that policy effectively did for them was create a reinvestment into the state's agricultural economy. So um, just to wrap up, again, sort of the future is out there somewhere, but it starts right here with the decisions that we make and, and moving forward. And uh, I'll stop there. Um, my contact info, Sequential's website, um, and at the end here I have some brochures and whatnot if you're interested in more information. And at this point I will take questions. Yes? I know you mentioned, you only mentioned canola as an agricultural product. Is there any other products in this climate in between Oregon and Washington that would be growing to become more self-sufficient? Well, Oregon State has done some looking into other alternative crops, but what you find in agricultural crops is when the research is really focused, they're able to increase the yields and you know, really focus on that particular crop. And canola has, that's been done with canola. So there are other crops like camelina is one they're looking at in, in um, Montana. Um, some people have suggested sunflower or safflower, but we have real problems with dry summers here. Um, also with cool nights. So the reason we can't grow soy here, even if it was irrigated, is that soy needs really warm nights and we get, you know, we have no humidity here and we drop down into the 50s sometimes in the summertime. So canola in the immediate term is really the, the, um, the, the promise for, for Oregon agriculture and Washington. Yeah? Um, are uh, geneticists working toward a sort of converting or manipulating the genes of specific plants to allow them to be used here in a climate like ours? Um, Yes, I mean, I don't know about genetically modifying them. They're, most of the canola varieties in the Northwest come from University of Idaho, and they've had a, they've had a um, standard plant breeding program to, to you know, improve the crops for 20 years or something like that. So, um, but as far as genetically modifying them, I don't know that that's happened. Yeah. Um, how is it originally determined what can be used as an alternative fuel? How do you through all these different crops? Um, well, I think for, you know, the, the fuels themselves, I mean, ethanol is alcohol, right? Methanol, same difference. You could use methanol in place of, of ethanol as well. The biodiesel is simply that methyl ester made from any vegetable oil. Why particular crops have been used here in the U.S.? Um, soybean oil has been used because there's been a glut of it. And because it's very, you know, it's a very large industry already in the Midwest. Um, what's interesting is with soy crops, 
Um, soy is a, is a legume, it's a nitrogen fixer, it has protein, and the value of soy is really in the protein, which ends up in the meal. So soybean oil is kind of a byproduct that's not as valuable as the soybean meal. There was a lot of it around, and the soy industry kind of saw this and said, hey, you know, maybe here's something we could add value to this product that we don't really know what to do with all of it. In Europe, in contrast, they grow canola in Europe um, and rapeseed, which is a similar, similar crop, um, and they use rapeseed and canola there because that's what they have, what they have there. By the same token, corn, you know, corn is, uh, has, been, has had years and years, decades of research done to increase the starch content, and therefore it's the, most, um, it's the most efficient producer of starch, therefore the most efficient producer of ethanol. And again, really almost monoculture in the Midwest in corn, so it was a matter of the corn growers going, well, here's, a, here's another opportunity for us to to use our crop in another use. Yeah. Um, are the same amounts of pesticides and herbicides needed on these crops to be able to produce fuels? Um, that's a tough one. I mean, herbicides and pesticides, I'm not, I'm not a farmer by any means, but I think you know, the reason that the farmers use them is to improve their yield, because to a farmer, yields everything. Um, uh, is it different because they're not food-based crops, not necessarily. They're still going after high yield. By the same token, I think a huge advancements have been made in agriculture in, in reducing the amount of herbicides and pesticides and even fertilizers that they use because the cost is so high. Um, you know, we looked at the, the petroleum declining. We could look at similar things happening in natural gas and what, what high diesel prices scare farmers in a big way, but high natural gas prices and declining natural gas is even more scary because that's the source of their fertilizer. So they're looking at ways to try to reduce their inputs as much as possible to reduce their cost of production. Yeah? I just wanted to get an idea of the current cost or the current price per gallon of um, biodiesel, the different blends. Sure. Um, in Portland, the price has been three twenty nine dollars a gallon retail for a year at those retail pumps. Um, commercial fuel is always a little less expensive because the volumes are so big. Um, and then basically, you know, B20 is, the price is changing all the time, but it's 20% of that 329 and 80% of whatever diesel looks like that day. So. Okay, so the 329, that's pure. It's B99.9, .9, yep. It's not bad. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, how do the costs compare, like cost of production across the various? Uh, is it cheaper to produce bioethanol, biodiesel? Then how do these compare to, say, producing one gallon of gasoline? Uh, I'm not. F well, let me answer it this way because this is kind of an interesting um, angle on it. Um, National Renewable Energy Laboratory has done a number of studies looking at um, if you use one unit of fossil energy, and fossil energy, right, petroleum or natural gas energy to produce a gallon of ethanol, you know, how much ethanol do you produce? One unit of fossil energy to produce biodiesel, how much do you produce? Well, they say that for ethanol right now, conventional corn ethanol, one unit of fossil energy in, you get about 1.15 to 1.3 units of energy out. So a net energy gain, despite what always ends up in the media with sort of the naysayers in ethanol, it is a positive energy balance. With biodiesel, it's one unit of energy in to about 3.2 units of energy out. So it's even better. Um, and when they look at this for petroleum, their numbers that they came up with petroleum were that for every unit of fossil energy into petroleum production, you get 0.83 units out. So they show that what they were showing is that from an energy balance perspective, petroleum is actually a net loser. However, petroleum is still very inexpensive compared with vegetable oil or corn that has to be produced you know, agriculturally every year, whereas these petroleum wells are sitting there and it's as much as it costs to pump them out of the ground. You talked about uh, how it's important to have regional sources and also how biodiesel is just a small part of the overall fuel source. Do you think the Northwest has the agricultural capacity to actually meet an increase a significant source of fuel? Um, actually, Oregon Department of Ag has done some studies on what would be the maximum amount of acreage that could be grown in Oregon for biodiesel, for example. Um, and they're saying the absolute upper end is about 400,000 acres. Um, canola will produce 
100 gallons an acre. So I think we're talking about um, about uh, 40, 40 million gallons of, of vegetable oil per year. And so, you know, how does that compare to the diesel market? It's, you no, know, we're not going to replace it. And on a, on, a, on a national scale, are we going to replace, could we replace all the gasoline with ethanol, all the diesel with biodiesel? No, we couldn't. We couldn't grow enough to be able to do that. And I think the message there really is more, that's one of we really need to figure out ways to use less. You know, the, the cheapest energy out there is the, the gallon you never used or the kilowatt hour that you never used. And so there's, there's real, a real message there in terms of trying to increase efficiency, reduce consumption, all kinds of answers, mass, you know, more mass transit, more trains, you know, all those kinds of things. You mentioned a moment ago that um, the media reports that uh, ethanol and uh, bioethanol and biodiesel are not energy efficient in terms of energy in and energy out. And I have seen some of those reports, so I'm interested. Um, what is incorrect about those reports um, that makes it actually a, uh, ener a net energy gain for production? Well, some of the things that they'll do, for example, is in ethanol, when you produce, you take grains, you cook them, you get the starch, you produce ethanol, you get a byproduct that's fairly significant volume that's a livestock feed. Well, they don't consider that energy. They consider all the energy that went into that went into the ethanol and no energy went into the livestock feed. So that, that doesn't make any sense. And other, otherwise, on the ethanol side, it's largely old data, you know, yield data that is that, you know, 1970 type yields on corn, which corn... They've increased yields over 30 years of like 700%, seven times. So it's really a matter of how you want to look at it. And, you know, uh, they'll, they'll consider all the energy that went into producing the metal for the tractor that, you know, was going to produce corn anyway, whether it went into ethanol or whether it went into the food market or whether it went into some other crop. So there's really some kind of skewed ways of looking at it because there's a certain amount of energy you're going to use anyway. It doesn't matter what you're producing. In the back. Um, in this day and age, it seems to be that we're looking for any alternative source for fuels right now. How long do you think it'll be before biofuels and uh, uh, the ethanol being competitive with the petroleum product itself? Price competitive? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, you know, I get this question a lot. When is biodiesel going to be as cheap as diesel fuel? And I say, when diesel fuel is three fifty a gallon. You know, and it's true. It's absolutely true. I mean, we've we've seen crude up to seventy dollars a barrel. Um, and there's sp always been speculation when it's going to go to 80 or 100, and um, that's going to be the situation. That is when it will push the market. So these tax credits and incentives that have happened, you know, at the federal level and to some degree at the state level will help get those industries started, but at some point, and you look at Hubbard's curve and you think about the production around the world and the consumption around the world, um, when we get, when supply and demand are close to each other, and one, you know, and, and supply goes out of whack and demand continues, that's when you get big price spikes. And that's what we saw after Katrina. You know, that's what we would see if we had issues in the Middle East where, um, you know, looking at things like, uh, talk about energy security, there are some sulfur clearing towers in Saudi Arabia that if they were to be knocked out, saw all Saudi oil would be down for a couple years to rebuild these sulfur clearing towers. So, you know, it's a matter of it's a matter of price of petroleum, really, rather than price of biofuels, which have been pretty steady. And then, in terms of you know how much can you produce? I mean, the ethanol industry says that with traditional ethanol that I talked about here today, cellulosic ethanol, you may have heard about taking you know woody waste and straw waste and turning it into ethanol. They they think they could hit maybe 20 billion gallons of ethanol per year. We use 120 billion gallons of gasoline so far, so you know it's it's a percentage there. Um, and then for biodiesel, the biodiesel industry says it's, it's gearing for a billion gallons within five years. Um, and I don't know where, the upper lim where they believe the upper limit may be there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in, in one of the slides, you showed a list of all the um, government agencies and people who are using biofuels. Uh, what, what are you doing to build partnerships with other organizations? or other companies to get them to use more biodiesel in their biofuels? Um, well, I mean, we're, we're a private company and a marketing company, so you know, we're out there all the time looking for other, um, other companies that, that use diesel or use gasoline and they want to 
use biofuels and promote the fact that they're using biofuels, you know, that they're doing the right thing. So that's sort of a constant, a constant um, piece. On the production side, we're always um, working with government agencies um, to help find property, to help um, maybe um, uh, and create larger markets. I mean, we've been involved with the city of Portland talking about what they want to do. We've supplied their fleet. So it's, it's been more an issue of just kind of getting it out there and educating people that this is a really seamless product. It really is a, it works. It's really a good product. And then, you know, letting them come around. Uh, car manufacturers like Chrysler, GM, responded by introducing a more diesel engine cars for the consumer? Um, there have been a couple new diesels in the last couple years. I mean, um, Jeep, which is Daimler Chrysler, brought the Liberty um, a couple years ago. Grand Cherokee, I think, next year is going to be in diesel. Um, but, you know, Volkswagen has the high efficiency, you know, Jetta, Beetle, Passat that are uh, Passats are not quite as good on mileage, but the other ones are up around 45 or 50 miles to the gallon. Um, so, no, the, the American auto manufacturers really haven't jumped in, um, and I think their perspective has been that, that Americans don't like diesel, that you know they're not really interested in diesel. Um, but I think as the price of fuel increases, and if the Japanese manufacturers start bringing diesel to the U.S., you know, why are the American manufacturers always responding you know, to the Japanese manufacturers doing something first. Um, but I think that'll, that'll light a fire under them. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, had, I've had some folks who currently run bio um, express concerns about the new low sulfur um, catalyzed engines coming into the States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, and what you're talking about is really the emissions control on those. So the engine itself, although they're making big advances in diesel technology in terms of how the engine works, those emission control devices are really tailpipe devices. And um, currently what's coming to the market is ultra-low sulfur diesel, 15 parts per million sulfur max, which is reduced down from what was 500 parts per million max. And what was happening um, with the sulfur is that with an emissions control device, catalytic converter, there's a chemical catalyst in there. The high sulfur would kill the catalyst and make that emissions control device, you know, inoperable. Now with ultra low, it's low enough that, that the catalyst will work. Well, biodiesel has never had sulfur in the fuel. So it's never been an issue with those catalytic converters. So um, in Seattle, they've been running B20 on newer style engines for um, over a year with some of the fleets up there. And they haven't seen any difference. So, so they, actually, they actually have that access to the ultra-low sulfur up in Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, big, the refiners have been producing ultra-low for a couple years. And they pushed it into the new markets, um, Los Angeles and the Puget Sound area were both sort of testing areas for it before it went nationwide. Yeah. What's the availability of biofuels off of the I-5 corridor? other parts of the nation? In other parts of the nation? Well, I mean, like ethanol, you know, biodiesel is available in the Midwest, but it has tended to be B2 or B5 or B20. They haven't really been interested in the really high blends. Um, and, you know, beyond that, I mean, you either have to be close to a production facility or close to some distributor that's moving em enough product. So here in Oregon, pretty much any distributor, any tanker truck company can get it now. Um, I'm I would assume in the Midwest it's pretty similar. Northeast is probably not as good. Southeast is probably not as good. Um, um, there's some companies in Colorado that are doing it. There are definitely companies in California that have been pushing it for a few years. So, um, you know, West Coast s seems to be a little more progressive and a little more interested in it. Yeah. Yeah. Does your company work with the production of methane, um, and do you consider energy from like cow manure and 
anaerobic digesters to be another alternative renewable energy source? Yeah, we've, we don't do anything with it now. We've certainly looked into it. Um, and I think any place where you can take what's basically a waste stream and turn it, you know, turn it into a, a recycled energy, there is real benefit there. Um, Europe's done a lot with anaerobic digestion, um, both from manure, which is a pretty low energy value feedstock, um, all the way to like source separated organics from homes. And it's basically like a, instead of composting, you're basically putting it into a, a, a piece of equipment that's like a large stomach, right? So that's literally what it's like. So um, it's definitely been done in Europe. We've looked at it a little bit. Um, you're starting to see some ethanol plants now in the U.S. designed um, near cattle uh, um, feedlots and whatnot. They'll take the manure. They'll turn it into, into biogas. They'll use that as, um, to produce heat in the ethanol process, which is a really good efficiency. And then they'll take the spent grain from the ethanol and feed it back to the cattle. So, um, again, as energy prices rise, those kinds of efficiencies become more profitable for businesses um, and more expensive for businesses that don't do that. Yeah. Behind you. Yeah. And then you. Does Sequential okay. have intentions to open more retail outlets like they have in Eugene, the eco-friendly design? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've, we've looked at, um, we've been looking for property in Portland. It's hard to do. Our, you know, we have an office here and we have an office in Eugene, so um, we're very interested in doing that. And the response in Eugene has been fantastic and we really believe there's a market out there all along the West Coast for sure um, that would respond to, to those types of fuel stations. Yep. Yeah. Um, I know that in California, when I was shopping for my diesel, that in, I, I was told that in California you can't actually buy a new diesel passenger vehicle. Right. Um, is, do, do you foresee that that, is there talk that that policy would change with the introduction of these biofuels and the decreased emissions that they have? Um, the biofuels themselves will not be able to decrease the emissions to the point where they need to be. They're going to have to be technological, um, basically, equipment on the vehicle. Um, California has higher air quality standards than EPA. In fact, California is the only state that's allowed to exceed the EPA for, for a number of different environmental um, regulations. And for diesel, the emission that they're concerned about is, is what's called NOx. Uh, oxides of nitrogen, which is a ground-level smog-forming chemical. Um, and the original studies from NREL showed that biodiesel actually increased NOx just a little bit. And on the current um, uh, passenger vehicles, new Volkswagens, new Mercedes, they actually can't meet the, the NOx emissions um, for California. So the auto industry is working on that. There's a number of different um, technologies that they're looking at. Um, uh, Daimler Chrysler has one that's a, what's called a urea injection system. Um, Toyota just announced that they they got they found a they developed a technology that's even better and much less costly to be able to bring those NOx emissions down. So the auto industry knows about it. Um, Europe is pretty similar in what their emission structure is. So I think you'll see that the that the engine design and the emissions controls will get to a point where they'll meet that. Um, and California's emissions uh, profile right now. Basically, the U.S. Um, regulations are, they're getting tighter and tighter. So what California has now, the U.S. will have, I think, in like 2010. So the engine manufacturers have to respond to that. Other questions? What's the difference in the energy content between biodiesel and diesel? Um, biodiesel by BTU content is about 10% less BTUs. Um, so from an energy you know, density perspective, you would think that you'd see a little bit of uh, mileage reduction. Um, but the lubricity is so much higher in biodiesel, there seems to be some efficiency gained. So the, uh, on you know, translating into miles per gallon, B100 customers and fleets especially, they really, they're the ones who really track mileage. They'll notice maybe a 5% reduction in mileage at B100 because of that BTU difference. Um, Similarly, ethanol is lower in BTUs than gasoline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a few years ago for a sustainable society class, I read a book, a book called Perverse Subsidies, and it was talking about how subsidization, subsidization of uh, various markets um, ends up kind of uh, uh, skewing our perception of what the costs of things are. What do you think about the possibilities of getting the government to stop subsidizing uh, petroleum 
and instead, and which would in turn just make biofuels that much more attractive in comparison to the cost of petroleum. Do you think that that's possible? Um, well, I think it was. I think it was Exxon. Was it was it Exxon Mobil or Chevron that posted ten billion dollars in profits in a quarter? That can buy a hell of a lot of lobbying power. So, will we ever see reduction of subsidies on petroleum exploration, transportation, refining, and all those kinds of things? I seriously doubt it. And we probably don't want to see that because cheap energy has been a policy in this country and our economy is driven by that. So I think the subsidies on biofuels are just to match, you know, sort of the, the more hidden subsidies on petroleum fuel. But we need that energy source today to run the economy and uh, we're going to have to figure out some other policy issues to transfer, you know, translate um, new energy sources down the road. But, you know, the petroleum industry is very, very powerful, very, very wealthy, and what any business doesn't want to see is less sales next year than they saw last year. So hard to, hard to compete with that. Yeah. I think we'll end with a question from the web. So is there any uh, validity to the uh, uh, expression that uh, biofuels have an impact on the long-term durability of diesel engines? Well, the, um, there haven't been any like very specific studies except for one in um, Yellowstone National Park. One of the first um, test cases was a three-quarter ton Dodge Cummins truck. Um, they ran the truck uh, for 100,000 miles on B100, um, cold weather, warm weather. They had some heating packages on the truck. At the end of that 100,000 miles, they broke it down, had it uh, assessed by factory mechanics, and their assessment was it looks like a regular diesel engine. So... Um, Interestingly enough, in Europe, um, all the engine manufacturers are uh, perfectly fine with biodiesel made to the European standards. The engine manufacturers here have been slower to come around, um, but I think it's a cleaner burning fuel. It's a much higher lubricity fuel. I don't think that there are really any issues with durability or, or engine life with biodiesel. Uh, before we thank our speaker for today, uh, next week the topic is Flex Car 101. Brody Hylton from Flexcar will be giving the presentation. So with that, I want to thank Thomas for giving us an excellent presentation. If anyone's interested, um, I do have information and some uh, brochures that tell the locations of the sites here in Portland. So home heating oil also. Uh -huh. Emissions uh -huh. and we're specifically doing a diesel biodiesel emission comparison. So I was wondering your data there. You said it was from the EPA website. Um, EPA has that data. NREL National Renewable Energy Laboratory also has the data. Yeah. The, um, the, those. Have you all talked to NREL? No. You should talk to NREL. I mean, 